Well, it's talked about the idea of fear, and I think uh, in society, AI has produced a lot of fear, especially the idea of, um, are we going to have a job in the future? AI seems to be able to do so many things. But I, I think there's one thing that we do regard as uniquely our human domain, and it's something that is expressing what it means to be human, and that's creativity. But I think already um, in the exhibition that we're seeing here at the Barbican, uh, there are hints that AI may be even able to, to creep into our uh, world of, of the creative world. And, and I think the for me, I really saw a sea change that happened in that very famous story a couple of years ago now, um, when AlphaGo uh, managed to beat the world's best uh, player at this game, ancient game uh, of Go. Uh, developed by DeepMind, it forms the centerpiece of the exhibition here at the Barbican, looking at the interaction of AI on the arts. Um, this piece of code learned on the way humans played the game, then played itself, played, made synthetic games that it learned from, um, and was able to achieve such a high level that it beat Lee Sedol four games to one. Uh, Lee Sedol regards that one game that he did win as the most valuable game of his whole career. Um, now, maybe not so extraordinary that uh, we've got computers doing things at uh, such a high level. We've already seen chess played um, by computers uh, in the 90s. Um, but I think something significantly different happened um, with the AI playing this game. The game of Go is one that requires a lot of intuition to play. When you talk to a Go player, they're often not very clear why they're making particular moves. There's a lot of pattern recognition as the stones build up on the board, something the human brain is very good at reading into patterns but not perhaps articulating why they are seeing patterns there. It's a game which involves a lot of creativity. And in the past, um, computer science regarded this as a game which you could not code up. But because this idea of not having to do code from a bottom-up manner, but building the code from the, bottom, uh, from the bottom, being able to learn how to play the game, failing and from failure learning to do new things, this code developed into this very powerful machine. But there was something very significant, I think, which happened here, which marked a phase change in the way AI is approaching uh, kind of problem solving. And that happened in game two uh, on Move 37. Move 36, Lee Sedol placed a, black, a white stone on the board, went to the top of the hotel that they were playing in Korea. Uh, he needed cigarette breaks. Um, uh, AI currently doesn't need nicotine for stimulation. Um, the AI sat there, thought for a while, and then asked the human player, this wasn't an exercise in robotics, we still find it quite difficult to make something which will pick a stone up and put it very nicely on the board. Ask the, um, player, the, the uh, human player to place a stone on the fifth row in. Um, all the commentators that were watching this gasped because traditionally your Go master teaches you that early on in the game, you only play on the first four rows in, that that's where the early competition goes on for territory, on the edges and on the um, kind of starting to creep into the board. And it's regarded, if you play on the fifth row this early on, as an incredibly weak move. And I remember watching these obsessively on YouTube. Um, uh, I was going through a bit of an existential crisis because I regard this game as very similar to doing mathematics. And if code could play this game, maybe my job was going to be under threat. And I remember the moment the commentators just gasped and said, well, it's made a huge mistake. Lee Sedol will be able to win this game. And when Lee Sedol came back down from uh, the roof, he too looked at this move and just couldn't understand why it had played such a weak move. Um, yet as the game went on and more territory built up from the bottom right-hand corner, it turned out that that move 37 was crucial in, a, uh, in AlphaGo winning this game. He control, it controlled the territory uh, because of that early play of that black stone. And for me, this past three uh, qualities that I think uh, we should uh, be looking for in something that we regard as creative. Um, I was on a committee of the Royal Society looking at the impact of machine learning on society. Demis Hassabis, uh, the mind behind AlphaGo, was there. But there was also um, a philosopher, uh, Margaret Bowden, and she's been thinking a lot about what um, the computers, or what she calls uh, tin cans, uh, might be able to achieve. And she has a nice working definition of, of what she regards as creative, and I think it's quite useful um, to have in mind as we go forward thinking about creativity this afternoon. Um, creativity should be something which is novel, new, well, computers can easily make new things, and that's quite objective, we can judge that. But it's these other two qualities, surprise and value. 
And of course, surprise and value are much more subjective. Uh, value for one person, I might write a poem and value it very highly, but nobody else values it. But machine learning is going to enable um, an AI to actually learn what we find surprising and what we value. And I think in that game too, um, uh, Move 37, we saw something new. We saw something that surprised the commentators. And the confines of a game, it's very easy to judge something that has value. And I think what's exciting, as we've seen already, how AI can push our creativity into new realms. And this is certainly what's happened with the game of Go. We were playing this game in a very, what we thought was an optimal way, uh, only play on the first four rows in early on in the game. But the AI has shown us that there are new ways to play this game. What we thought was a, the optimal way turns out to just be what we call in mathematics a local maximum. If you take a risk and explore other territory, you might find an even better way to play the game. I think uh, we behave very much like machines quite often, and we need something to push us out of our mechanical ways of thinking. And this is what happens certainly in the game of Go. Which is why I think that that moment uh, a couple of years ago uh, marks a watershed in what AI might be able to achieve. And it was what we're looking at in this exhibition here at the Barbican. And, and it sparked me off on a kind of journey to see, uh, well, if it can be creative in this confines of a game, where else can it be creative? Can it be creative in music, in the written word, in mathematics, or in the visual arts? And so this afternoon, I'm just going to take a little uh, look through the impact that AI creativity has had on the visual world, because that's actually one of the places that um, AI has had great successes. I made a program for the BBC uh, Horizon a few years ago about AI, and it was all very disappointing what it was able to do. And computer vision was one of the great hurdles that they hadn't passed. But machine learning allows uh, an AI to learn what's in an image and then be able to perhaps produce its own interesting images. So um, here's your first exercise, a little AI art touring test. One of these images is made by an AI, and one of these is made by a human. This is an AI project that was done in Holland, where if you're going to be creative, perhaps looking at the creativity of the past is the place to start. What do we value? What do we think is great art? So they took all of Rembrandt's work, uh, learned the particular things which marked out his style, his use of light, um, the particular way he does a portrait, that kind of look in the eye, they were looking into the soul of the person that's being painted. Um, so uh, they managed to achieve an understanding of Rembrandt's work to produce, I think, something which is pretty convincing. So I wouldn't mind a little light up on the audience, because I'm going to go ask you a question. Which one of these do you think? Can you identify the one that was done by a human, by a soul, has a soul inside? and the one which somehow doesn't feel like it's communicating. So uh, let's take the image on the left to start with. Put up your hand if you think that that's the one done by artificial intelligence. And let's have a little survey. OK. And hands up if you think the one on the right is the one done by artificial intelligence. Um, so actually, a little bit, I would say, a majority going for the one on the right. Um, and who, who voted for the one on the right here? Anybody? Yes, what was sort of giving it away for you? Something about the detail on the neck. I mean, I think detail is something interesting. So you felt that meant it was probably artificial intelligence. So. OK, so you're wrong, actually. So this is the one done by artificial intelligence. And I think you know, the fact that you were pretty spirit, I mean, that was quite a brexit -y vote, actually, I think. It sort of wasn't quite uh, committed out either way. Um, uh, but uh, you know, I think it's a, a mark of how successful it has been to be able to produce something that split the audience so convincingly. But what's the point of looking at the art of the past, making new things? I mean, AI shouldn't be used for pastiche. It should be looking for, for new things. And, and certainly, um, Jonathan Jones, who hates anything to do with AI, AI and art, um, really criticized this project. He wrote, um, what a horrible, tasteless, insensitive, and soulless travesty of all that is creative in human nature when technology is used for things it should never be used for. But frankly, an art critic who wears a shirt like that, I don't trust terribly much on. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, and he's very critical. I, the, the review he wrote uh, of the exhibition here, I think, was very ill-informed. But, um, uh, you know, he has, uh, but I think you know, that's the point. People don't understand that the AI is meant to be pushing us into new realms. It can help us to understand old art in a new way. But I think the most exciting thing is, how can we use this as a tool, as we've seen with music just uh, before, to push us into doing new things? And here are some paintings that have been created by AI, which I think are starting to break the mold. Um, so again, I'm going to ask you a test. Four of these are done by a human. Four of these are done by AI. Can you sniff out the AI? So again, uh, let's uh, take a vote. Uh, put your hand up if you think the paintings on the uh, left are done by the artificial intelligence. Hands up if you think those are done by AI. 
Okay, very, very small number for that. Who, may, who thinks the ones on the right, then? Um, big votes for the runs on the right. Um, so, sir, what was, uh, for you, the indicator that myths may not be human? Looks like a deep learning. You, you can sniff out the deep learning. I mean, that's interesting. I think there's a, uh, <laughs> there's a very sophisticated, um, you know, so I can, I can smell deep learning behind. You are indeed right. These, these are the ones created by um, uh, artificial intelligence. What's interesting is this is created by something called a creative adversarial network, a sort of generalization into, of something called a, a general adversarial network. A, lot of the, a few of the projects that have been shown in the exhibition here at the Barber can use this idea. It uses uh, the fact that you can use two algorithms sort of working against each other. So one algorithm learns about the art of the past. It learns particular styles, pointless art, cubist art. It almost becomes an art historian by analyzing the art of the past. Then is asked to make something which breaks that mold, can't be classified. Um, so it tries to move into the new, but it can't go too far. It knows what we regard as art, and so it's got these two ends of the parameter spectrum that it's got to find the middle ground. The discriminator algorithm then judges whether, no, that I identify as still something with a particular style. You haven't broken the mold, or else that's too much, uh, not something that we regard as art. And for me, I think this captures actually how the human white mind works creatively. Here's Paul Valéry, French poet, who said, it takes two to invent anything. The one makes up combinations, and the other one chooses. And there's a lot of evidence that uh, creativity is about an explosion of ideas, but then being critical and judging which one really is worth putting forward. So it's interesting, I think, that, that uh, uh, the algorithm behind pushing these into the new is using something that we as creatives um, actually use in, in our ideas, uh, that sort of positive, uh, the good cop, bad cop sort of approach. But actually, I think the most interesting thing about AI art is to look at seeing whether we can use it to understand the mind of the AI, or the emerging mind, perhaps, potentially. Um, and so, so I think one of the interesting projects I saw in writing this book about uh, creativity and code was actually produced this rather kitsch sort of art. Um, but it was a deep dream, this idea that Google has very good visual re recognition software, they were interested to know, well, what actually is this vision seeing in these pictures? It can classify them, but could we actually see how it is classifying it? The machine learning is producing code that's quite hard to, to kind of look and see how it's making its decisions. And going forward, that's gonna be really important. If it's deciding on a job for you, or a medicine that you might take, we'd like it to articulate why it's doing things. We want to see how it sees the world. So here's an image um, of a string quartet I play in. The uh, Google recognition software identified musical instruments, people, chairs. But then Deep Dream says, OK, show me what you're really seeing. Um, and so it says, just dial up and accentuate any image that you can see inside there. So when I put this through Google uh, Deep Dream, this is what emerged. Lots of strange animals, faces, a car which began to emerge out of three lower strings. Um, you don't begin to understand how the AI has learnt. It's learnt on lots of images of faces, of animals. It starts to give us a sense of, of how it sees the world. And in this way, we can pick out important ideas about bias. Um, uh, for example, uh, these are images, just random pixels, that it started to see dumbbells beginning to emerge in this. But all the dumbbells had arms attached to them. And we began to realize, well, of course, it had only ever learned about dumbbells which were being picked up by humans. It thought it was part of our anatomy. And so by using the art, we can start to sniff out um, perhaps potential biases that are beginning to, to creep into um, this code. And as Marshall McLuhan once said, you know, art is our distant early warning system that can be always relied on to tell the old culture what is beginning to happen to it. Which is why I think it's so important that this event is taking place here at the Barbican. Uh, and we're looking at how the world of music, visual art, uh, plays can help us to understand how this new AI is emerging. Because I think it's going to be a real challenge going forward. This AI is becoming more and more sophisticated. It's quite possible that it might one day become conscious. You know, suddenly my phone might suddenly say, iPhone think, therefore iPhone am. And I'm going to have to you know, question, is there a consciousness inside there? I think art is perhaps our best fMRI scanner for understanding what our internal worlds are like. After all, why do we produce art? Why do we paint? Why do we write music? Because we want to express our internal world and share it with another human being. Um, it, the hard problem of consciousness is all about the fact that how can I know what your pain is like and whether it's anything like my pain? 
And so I think going forward, as AI begins to get or already an internal world that we don't understand, that this, these tools of art and creativity could well be our best way of, of kind of sharing our worlds between us. Because as Wittgenstein said, um, if a lion could speak, well, we're not going to be able to understand him. Uh, and as AI emerges, it's going to be a very different sort of internal conscious world if it ever does appear from ours. And its creativity, probably, and its art will be the best way to understand what it might like, be like to be a piece of AI. Thank you. <laughs>